thank you very much. And great to have this perspective as well. It's good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, dive straight into it. Um, we've talked a lot about how much has happened. I think uh, colleagues were using different time frames, eight years, 18 months, but just sort of this past year, perhaps, um, what developments have uh, you seen? And I'm going to have this one to all of you because I think your perspectives are, are so unique and distinct on this. Um, what are you most concerned about in terms of the development in online harms? And also um, share with me a bit sort of the concrete work that you are doing or your organization is doing uh, in this space. And if you'd like, uh, and I imagine we just we discussed this on the call that we had, um, just how multi-stakeholder cooperation has been important to achieving your goals. And I'm seeing Roberta right next to me, so okay. take it away. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, so at DDIA, we are looking at the impact of online harms on Latino communities and connecting the dots between the cycle of information and misinformation, extremist content, et cetera, between US-based Latino communities and our communities in different countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and so what am I most concerned about? Um, I would say three things. One is um, the rise in levels of distrust based on some of the, the research that we've done. So distrust and I would say skepticism. Um, the second is polarization. And the third, I would say, is um, black and white thinking. So at DDIA, we did a couple of polls this year. One is in the field right now. And we wanted to get a sense of to what extent Latino communities were seeing and believing a series of different narratives and claims. Um, we also assessed um, which stakeholders they trusted most. And there were some questions asked about AI. And I think one of the things that concerned me the most that connects back to those issues is that one, this is good and bad. Uh, the majority of the people we surveyed, 62%, um, were actually uncertain about whether what they were seeing online was true or false. I think that means that there's skepticism both about credible and non-credible information, um, which depends on which way you take it. Um, the second thing that was concerning for us was that uh, conspiratorial narratives were penetrating at very high rates, like higher rates than I expected. So narratives like, for example, elites are conspiring with social media companies and the news media to hide the truth from us, and there's a deep state of political actors um, that will work to keep society down. Of the people who had been exposed to that, upwards of 45% like agreed that that was true. Um, and so I think that was very concerning for me. Um, and then lastly, the distrust piece. So. Um, we measured which stakeholders people were most trusting. And the only stakeholders out of a list of maybe like 20 that included everything from the Supreme Court to journalists and fact checkers to political parties and poll workers, the only stakeholders that were trusted across party lines were scientists and neighbors. And neighbors, I suspect, only because we tend to live near people who are like us. And so there was a huge, huge partisan divide between Latino Republicans and Latino Democrats and independents um, in levels of trust in stakeholders. So clearly, I think the polarization issue is one and the distrust issue is another. Thank you so much, Roberta. That's uh, really enlightening, uh, but also very concerning. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. Uh, and thank you to All Tech is uh, Human for inviting me to this wonderful, uh, wonderful summit. Um, so uh, I head up the tech policy team at the British Embassy in Washington. So I will give a far less interesting perspective than Roberta, uh, but I'll sort of speak from the from, from the kind of national, uh, national level. Um, the UK has been on a real journey around online safety over the past half a decade. Uh, we first started discussing the, uh, the creation of an online safety bill uh, about five years ago. And uh, in October uh, last year, October 2023, uh, the, the, we, we achieved the landmark moment of finally passing our online safety bill into law, uh, and it then became uh, the UK's Online Safety Act. Essentially, what this bill does, or what this act does, is it provides a set of, it creates a, a set of statutory duties on social media companies and on search providers to ensure that they are taking robust steps to protect uh, children and and, and adults online uh, and, and protect users' safety. Um, it, the, the bill is quite sprawling and there are a number of elements which I won't go into the, the, the full range, but obviously you know, it covers a number of the illegal, um, uh, illegal challenges. So you know, uh, issues such as uh, child sexual abuse material, 
uh, terrorist content, fraud, uh, foreign interference. Um, but the, the, the area that I'd bring out the most and the area that was really the greatest political focus uh, for both parties in the UK and and for for all um, all, all individuals that we sort of discussed the uh, the bill with um, is around protections for children. Some of the statistics here are really quite shocking. I think it's something like in the UK, eighty one percent of twelve to fifteen year olds in the past four weeks have uh, accessed uh, online material that is uh, th that is that is harmful, including materials such as uh, that promoting self harm or suicide. Uh, which is really quite shocking when you think about it. So what the bill does is it takes a really robust set of measures here and it places a statutory duty on social media companies to ensure that that type of content is not being accessed by children and it also provides greater redress mechanisms for parents and for others uh, if, they, if they come across instances of uh, uh, illegal online content or harmful online content, they, they have a greater ability to address those with the social me media companies and the social com media companies have a obligation to respond. Um, I think in terms of the multi-stakeholderism uh, here, I mean, this was absolutely fundamental to the entire past half of a decade. You know, we would not have been able to pass a bill, pass an act, had we not had extensive, extensive detailed discussions with all the various stakeholders that we needed to. So, you know, fundamental to this was engagement with civil society and with ad advocacy organizations and grassroots organizations to really make sure that we were understanding the the, the harms that were most impactful for, uh, for, for individuals uh, and for groups. But we also had extensive engagement with the social media companies, uh, with academics and, uh, and with other governments as well uh, through the passing of the act. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jonathan and Filippo just, yeah. Yeah, let, let's perspective. widen the lenses even further since uh, Jonathan talked about regulation. Now we are bringing it to the global level and let's let's make it less abstract than that. What we are doing, um, I'm based in New York working for the Office of the Tech Envoy. We are a small team that does tech policy coordination. And basically over the last two years, I did one thing, supported um, the most important tech policy thing you've never heard of. Uh, that is the Global Digital Compact that, uh, fingers crossed, uh, will be an agreement that the heads of state, the world leaders will sign uh, this weekend at the Summit of the Future. One of the driving forces of the Global Digital Compact is online safety. Over these last two years, we held consultations um, in New York and around the world, and then the member states negotiated this agreement. Um, it's... It has been an interesting uh, exercise, I would say, because we engaged with some 6,000 stakeholders and way more entities have uh, contributed inputs to the Global Digital Compact. And if we are addressing the perspective of online safety, the threshold of what emerged as a common thread is different from what you can see at the national level or on the ground. So which are the common threads and the common concerns that are universal or as close a universal as possible? They represent uh, member states that maybe they have different views and different values that uh, Western countries and civil society organizations. Uh, so which are the common threads? Something very interesting, I guess, that uh, a lot of the talk right now is that we don't need that much trust and safety. We need platform that promote free speech that is often equated to less check and balances on the platforms. Stakeholders, member states, government, civil society, private sector are telling the opposite. We need more. We need more guardrails. We need guardrails from the companies, but also we need policy and we need regulation. This was one of the common threads. The second one, and it's something that Jonathan just mentioned, is the constituency. We each and every part of the world, each and every, um, I guess, stakeholder, to use one term, as a different referent object. But one point of agreement is that we need more policy and more public-private partnership on child protection and teen protection. And maybe a last one is something I want to echo something that in the first fireside chat that Roman mentioned on agentic AI. I'm not going to talk agentic AI also because I don't know one single thing about agentic AI. Um, but um, the thing that users can just opt out. Well, in a global perspective, a lot of people don't have the option to opt out. Uh, 
because uh, maybe that specific messaging platform is the only tool they have to access reliable information and they need accurate information and they need information in the language. That's why another strong element is multilingualism, like a tiny part of the world speak English and a tiny part of the world is a native English speaker. So is, an, is this connection between um, the tools and the protection around these tools? Because for a lot of people, a lot of people don't have the option to step out. Um, I could rumble a lot more on what the UN is doing, but I want to acknowledge that uh, we will have on stage, I think, um, after this very panel, and the Secretary General, Melissa Fleming, that in a way more eloquent way can elaborate further on this. Thanks, Filippo, and, and thanks all, um, and thanks for sharing those insights. I wonder, um, based on, on these lessons and, and the important sort of research that you've each carried out and the work that you've done, what you each see as the next milestone in, in how you hope to, what you hope to achieve in, in your work um, to address online harms. And based on also the, the different experiences you've had with multi-stakeholder engagement, maybe highlight some of the challenges, some of the key contributions, and what uh, folks need to take away in their own work uh, to make sure that, that this happens and, and happens in a meaningful way. Um, so picking up on the question that you asked earlier that I did not answer on multi-stakeholder, engagement. Um, so one of the silver linings of working on um, disinformation and misinformation specifically as two types of online harms is that now I believe that we understand the trends and the patterns and the meta narratives and the more recycled claims that get repeated over and over in different contexts across different countries. And that would not be possible without multi-stakeholder collaboration and also researchers that have the capacity, the language skills and the experience to look at multiple countries and their connections at once. So for example, um, the election fraud narratives that we see a lot in the United States play out in Brazil in very similar ways, more similar ways than you'd realize. And bad actors that are sort of advancing the election fraud claims are connected and amplifying each other's content in different languages, even when they don't speak the same language. Um, and so a lot of the, I would say, the claims that underpin election fraud narratives, for example, polls being rigged or dead people voting or non-citizens voting, those claims are not new. They've been used in elections dating back at least 15 years. And I think that if we can, as a society or as a group of stakeholders working in this field, begin to recognize that more and more, we can get ahead of it more and more working together. Um, the second thing I would say is I at DDIA, so connecting back to what I hope to do next year. So when we founded DDIA, we founded it on the premise that um, the perspective of Latin America and Latin Americans needed to be more prevalent in spaces where decisions get made. Um, and we saw a really big gap between organizations that worked with Latino communities, for example, in the United States and those working in the region, where it didn't make sense to us that Latinos here in the U.S. would not be talking to organizations in countries across the region. And so our advisory council both comprises people from across the Americas, but it also comprises people in different disciplines. And that was what that's what I'll end on is I think often in these rooms, we do see policymakers, we do see government, we do see advocates and we do see journalists. Um, I don't think we see enough of the other disciplines that are connected to this. So for example, psychologists, behavioral scientists, cult experts, financial professionals. Like I think there's like a whole world of people who work on manipulation, whose perspectives are connected to this, and they're testing and innovating in the solution space in really interesting ways that we should actually take into consideration. Great. That's a great takeaway. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think just first to, to sort of um, uh, agree strongly with some of the points that Filippo made. Uh, I mean, um, w one of the challenges that through the creation of the Online Safety Act, t two of the tensions that we had to consider quite deeply were firstly around proportionate enforcement and secondly around sort of freedom of expression. Um, so on, on the sort of enforcement piece, one of the kind of one of the challenges here that we, we had when we were talking to a number of social media companies is that many social media companies, as everyone in this room knows, have quite extensive terms of service. I mean, we, we can critique those terms of service, but uh, but they do uh, outline a number of principles that the social media companies should be abiding by. The challenge that we uh, perceived was that very often those terms of services are not actually enforced, which means that they're pretty much worthless. 
So, so this was one of the things that we really wanted to address, which was, you know, to some degree, to some degree, we're defining the terms of service for you. We're, we're outlining some of the key principles, but also a lot of this is already in your existing terms of service. All we're doing is just adding the stick of enforcement and really putting putting teeth on this, and and then, uh, uh, you know, having the ability for our regulator to to um, uh, to uh, impose quite severe penalties if if companies don't uh, don't comply. Uh, and just on the freedom of expression point, this was something that we really. Uh, really grappled with as well, and one of the one of the provisions within the act is around uh, user empowerment. And essentially, what this does is it requires that social media companies need to provide more mechanisms through which users can choose the types of content that they want to see and don't want to see. Uh, and uh, and it um, again provides a statutory requirement uh, for for social media companies to do so. The the focus for us really going forwards is implementation. So we you know we now have this uh, we, we we have a regulatory tool. Uh, the question now is how do we inf how do we implement and enforce that in a way that is uh, effective and that continues that multi stakeholder dialogue? So we have now uh, given uh, Ofcom our, uh, our regulator for communications an official role as our online safety regulator, and we've we've given it uh, statutory provisions thereof. And so Ofcom is now uh, 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 publishing a number of codes of practice and has 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 um, had a number of uh, further consultations around some of the key provisions, particularly on illegal content on protect and on protection of children. Fundamental to this process is continued multi-stakeholder collaboration. We're very clear that the problem set changes day by day, and that if we don't respond to that and we don't continue the dialogue, we're very rapidly going to uh, the, the the laws are not going to be achieving what they really should be doing. Uh, and and a, a, a piece of um, uh, evidence for this is our new government. One of the one of its first actions is when when it came into uh, government was uh, to look at the issues around uh, intimate images being shared, so called revenge porn. And so we will be through secondary legislation updating some of that legislation to to cover those those risks as well. Wow. Uh, what um, can I add? Like, what's next for the next? I don't know. 12 months, 24 months, what I see on the horizon. Let me go back to the Global Digital Compact that I already mentioned. It would not have been possible to shape the agreement that, again, still um, is up to the world leaders to see whether it will be agreed or not. But um, it has been made possible by the contribution of all the thousands of stakeholders. If we want to make something out of it, we will need all of you literally all of your companies, organizations, your, your personal capacity to engage for the next phase. That will be uh, the implementation phase. Uh, why? There are some of the provisions in the compact, actually most of the provisions in the compact that cannot be implemented by governments alone because they are, they are multi-stakeholder by nature. Uh, for instance, we, if you are going into the part that is more on online safety, um, trust and safety, there are proposals there to start a dialogue between online safety commissioner. So maybe this can uh, facilitate the sharing of best practices. There are provisions uh, in which um, member states commit um, to facilitate the sharing of factual um, information, especially during situation of crisis. And I, I know that um, we might take some of these things for granted. But again, talking from a global perspective, we cannot take that um, as, a, as a given. And just to give an example on how this can make a difference and why we need stakeholders, maybe let me go back before uh, my, time, um, my time at the UN. Um, I used to work uh, for a company that now is called X. It wasn't called X back then. Um, and uh, one of the major challenges was um, to uh, work on the Kenyan, on the last Kenyan election and to tackle the spread of misinformation and disinformation. That And I remember, again, this was before joining the UN. I had no conception whatsoever of what the UN were doing. But having colleagues, as I mentioned, from the Department of Global Communication and other people from the UN on the ground working with po Kenyan policymakers, with civil society organizations, for instance, Africa Check, to contribute to avoiding the spread of misinformation around that election, that was key. And that is something that the Global Digital Compact is trying to do on a broader scale. And again, what I hope for the next 12 months is that all together we can 
um, start building the future and strengthening what we have already and building what we don't have in some of the countries. Thanks, uh, Filippo. And I feel like you're taking the cue for um, the last question here, which which I seek to tie back to this uh, just uh, such perfect title of, of our summit here, Ensuring Our Tech Future is Aligned with Democracy. Yesterday was also International Day of Democracy. And Nina Jankovic uh, earlier said this is the year of, of, of AI elections, obviously a key part of democracy. Um, so I just want to hear uh, from, from each of you, uh, possibly briefly, depending on, on how much time we have, um, with this year uh, of, of AI, so-called AI elections, uh, what do you see as the most important uh, tool or initiative um, that, that can help mitigate online harms uh, in this space? And I know both, uh, some of you have already touched on this, but if you just want to highlight this briefly, I think this will be important for us to, to touch on. So we, um, so DDIA, I am a part of four coalitions this year, and all of them in different ways are focused on solutions. So it used to be back in 2020, I was, I, I, our organization, our previous organization from which we spun off, um, was also part of some of these coalitions. And back then they were really focused on research, monitoring, social listening, defining narratives and claims, um, sharing what they were seeing. And this year, they are very focused on rapid reaction and guidance on the solution side. And so some of these coalitions have really built, I would say, an infrastructure that allows all of the different partners, all of the organizations that work directly with voters on the ground to receive and then disseminate guidance that is agreed upon um, by, I would say, like a cohort of 10 orgs and then recommended to the others that they can adapt based on their own expertise. So I think the coalitions have worked really well because in a rapid reaction moment, like, for example, the debate this week, last week, um, where Donald Trump talked about Haitian immigrants, unfortunately, um, falsely eating cats and dogs in Ohio, um, we the coalitions got together and they said, is this something we need to react to at all? Like, is this breaking out at scale enough? The orgs that do research got together. They looked, they said, on a scale of one to five, um, it's breaking out at X number. And then from there, very quickly, within 24 hours, they were able to put together guidance that pivoted from that to what people should actually be saying. And they said, you know, focus on the manipulation tactics, focus on the history of this information. And then here are the things that you can talk about when it comes to immigration that are fact-based and, con and convincing and on all of that. And so I think like this model, it's one that's interesting that I think could be applied in other regions um, that I would personally love to replicate in Latin America. It's got a lot of challenges. I think it's also very time consuming and for startups or small NGOs, maybe not sustainable, but it works, I would say, or at least it's getting better. And then lastly, I would just point out, I think that also comes in with when we're talking to funders. So for small NGOs like ours, often, I think, though we want to be collabor collaborative, we're put in a position where, in a way, we're competing with other new organizations. These coalitions that we're members of um, pool together funders. So at the top of each coalition is a also a coalition of funders, and they're throwing money specifically into these coalitions. And so I think no one has to be afraid that they won't get funding because everyone, in a way, is getting funding. And I, see, I think that the, that model is is one that we could look more into. So I think from our perspective, we're taking a few approaches. Um, domestically, there are a number of things that we're doing. So underneath the Online Safety Act, um, we introduced a new um, foreign interference effect uh, offense, which uh, essentially complies uh, social media companies when they become aware of state-backed misinformation or disinformation to take action to remove that. Um, we're also really keen on uh, media literacy campaigns, and so we're supporting a number of those to ensure that uh, users have greater understanding of the types of risks uh, that, that they're facing online. Um, in terms of the international uh, agenda, we're very active here and, and um, absolutely the, the UK is f fully behind uh, all of the work that Filippo is doing through the Global Digital Compact. That's, a, that's an absolutely vital tool here. We've been supporting the G7's rapid response uh, mechanism as well, which has been uh, an effective tool for, for promoting uh, information integrity. Um, I, I set myself a challenge before this uh, uh, discussion to try to go through a technology discussion without mentioning AI, but I have failed significantly. Um, so I will just mention that briefly. Obviously, one of the one of the 
key uh, challenges that we are facing this year, particularly is the emergence of multimodal models uh, and the risks around deep fakes. Um, so the UK has really been very focused on this, and we've taken a, a very active role in promoting the AI safety agenda uh, through the various safety summits in Bletchley and Seoul and looking ahead to the French uh, summit next year. Uh, but I think probably the most interesting development here is the creation of our AI Safety Institute, which we've now staffed up uh, quite rapidly. And it's already conducting quite extensive red teaming and analysis of generative AI models pre-deployment uh, in order to ensure that some of these risks are, uh, are, are, we are more aware of what these risks are. And I think the next step there is uh, widening out uh, the work that we've done domestically and the work that other countries have done domestically to really try to ensure regulatory alignment between AI safety uh, institutes that have been set up. So uh, the US will be hosting a, uh, an event later this year um, around an AI safety network. And I think that will be an important contribution to this event, uh, to, this, to this space. Thanks. Maybe just two words on what the UN is doing and then a personal take on your question, also mindful of the time. Um, they, at the UN, we have several um, instruments and um, some upcoming work on artificial intelligence when it comes to the recommendation on around AI and information integrity. There are um, the principles on information integrity, and I guess you will hear more about that in a second. And uh, also on Thursday, the advisory body of the Secretary General on Artificial Intelligence uh, will release its final report, recommendation for the global governance of artificial intelligence that will build on some of the initiatives that you might be uh, familiar with already, including the work that the G7, OECD, GPA, G20, and others um, are doing. So stay tuned on that. Uh, maybe a take on election, personal take on election and AI. AI eventually is a tool. And what we've been discussing for the last 30 minutes, it should apply to AI as well. Um, in terms of we need uh, multilingual content moderation to address this risk. We need to prioritize information integrity and trust and safety. Some of these risks are just amplified by AI. Some that is synthetic and um, um, synthetic and manipulated uh, media is not something new. It's just the scale in which it presents itself um, through AI-facilitated tool is like guns for hire. That is also the, one of the main distinction between misinformation and disinformation. There is sometimes there is not even a political motive, it's just out of financial incentives. So I think that um, the way forward for these AI elections, I personally don't like the hype of AI elections, is just finding a way this, this, to kind of scale up the same way um, to tackle with similar things at a different scale. Thank you so much. And I think with that, please join me in thanking Roberto, Johnny, and Filippo for a great presentation.